Okay, that's better. Hey there, everybody. It is, yeah, as I say, it's a hot one today. In my t-shirt. It's a bit sweaty. It's 90-something. So it's like, why would I start reading Little Women? It seems like such a wintry book. Well, I think any time's a good time to read a good book. And after all, Little Women takes place throughout the year or years, as the case may be. And I just realized that because I flipped the camera around so that you can see me, the lettering on the book is probably backwards. Hard to tell from here. Anyway, digressions and extremely awkward intros aside, there's something about classic literature, right? Even if it's timeless, which this one certainly is, it's great because it's readable even woo, over 150 years after the fact. Oh my gosh, time flies. Even if it's pretty timeless and shows that People are still people. Young women are still young women. Even with all that, it's a product of its time, right? Because there are all these basically pop culture references. If it was written today, there would be lots of stuff that we actually understand. Well, maybe not me personally, but I'm middle-aged now. And uh, so there's a lot of references nowadays I do not understand. And that's fair enough because every generation has its own references, and Louisa May Alcott's generation was no different. But yes, you read any classic novel, and there are all these references that you just don't get. You can, you can sometimes figure them out from the context, and it certainly adds to the flavor of the book. But overall, you're like, what does that even mean? Well, I have done the work. I have done the work. I've gone through it page by page and combed the internet. And I have found most, not all, I wasn't successful for all, but most of these references and what they mean. Of course, Little Women is an interesting one to do that with because it was not autobiographical, perhaps not even semi-autobiographical, uh, because she did change a lot. It's not about her and it's not about her life, but it is based a great deal upon her family and their experiences, and there's no doubt that Louisa May Alcott herself was Joe. So I'm going to dive right into all these references, and I'm going to try and keep a list down below. So if there's a specific one you're wanting to know about or look up, you can just skip right to it. But we're going to start with Louisa May Alcott and her family. The very, very basics, not a full bio, this is not a biopic, but just the very basics so that you can see where she was coming from, basically. Louisa May Alcott. Her mother was named Abby, the model for Marmy. Her father was named Bronson, the model for Mr. March, who I don't think got a cool name. Her father was largely self-educated. He came from a poor farming family, and he had a great desire for education in his youth. So part of that self-education, he got a copy of Pilgrim's Progress and taught himself to read. Later, he used that book to educate his children. Her father, Bronson, uh, had very high ideals. And for that reason, he didn't like to work work. He wasn't above working necessarily, but he had very specific ideas about working. And he always came up with these great pie-in-the-sky ideas, which resulted in the family moving around a lot. On the whole, the family moved around roughly 30 times in their life. Um, and one of the places they lived when Louisa was roughly 11, they moved to Concord, Massachusetts, to a house they called Hillside, and stayed there three years. Much of Little Women was based on the experiences here. However, at the time she wrote the book, they were living in a place called Orchard House. So the staging is actually Orchard House. She just moved the experiences there. Louisa May Alcott did indeed have three other sisters. Her older sister was named Anna and was the model for Meg. Louisa, of course, was Jo. The third sister was Elizabeth. They all called her Lizzie. And that was Beth. The last sister was May, and all she had to do was rearrange the letters for Amy. The last name March came from her mother's maiden name, which was also May. 
The family did not have a servant. They never could afford one. Uh, but apparently Louisa felt that she wanted to make the poor March sisters just a little better off than her own family. So she gave them Hannah. Her father did have a decent amount of success in his own way. He became quite known in certain circles as a philosopher. He was always trying to start philosophical schools and giving lectures, writing books, other things, things like that. So the family got around within these philosophical circles, and in their time, her parents and thusly Louisa, they rubbed shoulders with the likes of him, Lucretia Mott, William Lloyd Garrison, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Henry James, Louis Agassiz, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, John Brown, the abolitionist dude from the Civil War, Dorothea Dix, Mary Baker Eddy. Louisa also met Julia Ward Howe and Mary Mapes Dodge. She even sat with Mr. and Mrs. Frederick Douglass at a funeral. Two of her parents' best friends and neighbors were Henry Thoreau and Rolf Waldo Emerson, who was perhaps one of their best friends, at least to her father. He believed in him so strongly that he backed him and gave him money for lectures and even homes, pretty much whatever he wanted. Now, due to her family's uh, financial problems, Louisa determined to become financially independent, being able to not only support herself, but her family. She started to write stories, had them take off, uh, much like Joe, some of them were pot boilers, but unlike Joe, Louisa never apparently really felt ashamed of these. After all, they were good, solid stories, and she was making money off of them. Now, their father never went to Washington, never became part of the Civil War. However, Louisa became an army nurse tending wounded troops in Washington, D.C. Um, it was about after four to six weeks she came down with typhoid fever. Now, in the book, Marmy goes to visit their father in an army hospital, but in real life, it was their father who came to collect her and take her home for good. Due to the illness, the doctor ordered Louise's hair to be cut, and she felt much the same way about it as Joe did in the book. Her publisher and her father together pressured Louisa to write a book for children about real children, since before that, many of the children's books had been heavily moralistic i.e. probably incredibly dull. Her father was the one who thought her experiences growing up would provide good material, so Louisa gave in to the pressure, and in May 1868 she began work on Little Women. She worked in her room at a small half-moon desk that her father built between windows that looked out over the road. Her mother and her sisters also approved of the project, so she said, I plot away, though I don't enjoy this sort of thing. The final draft, before any publishing changes, was completed in just 10 weeks and clocked in at 402 pages. Louisa retained the copyright, which was a new idea at the time, and turned out to be an excellent business decision for her. It was published per a deal that also produced a book by her father known as Tablets. This was out in September of 1868. It was put out in 800 regular and 200 deluxe printings and received good reviews. You can still find it, at least electronically. The first edition of Little Women was small and bound in red cloth. The title and L.M. Alcott are set in small type on the cover in gold. Her sister May did four drawings for it, which were not well received, but she still had a lot of improvement to go ahead of her. The first printing of this was of 2,000 copies which all sold out by October after excellent reviews. A second edition was quickly ordered, and another 4,500 copies on top of that went out by the end of the year. The British edition was due out in December. All this was just the first volume. Given the reception, the publisher pressured Louisa for the second book in time to be released in spring. She began work the next day and wrote nearly an entire chapter each day. Book two was given the title Good Wives, which is still its title in England. I did not know that. And they're frequently published separately. The second book was published on April 14, 1869. 4,000 copies had been pre-ordered and 13,000 copies sold out within two weeks. It was funny, actually, because when she was writing it, she was irritated by the public and publishers constantly asking who the girls would marry. 
and was firm that I won't marry Joe to Lori to please anyone. She determined to marry Joe to the funniest sort of character she could come up with, hence Professor Bayer, who actually, we all kind of loved him. Now, Louisa was not a fan of fame and was good reason. The letters and photo requests piled up, which she mostly ignored. And more so than that, troops of visitors kept stopping by the house and just expecting to be welcomed. If they encountered her, they might be disappointed that her attitude was not welcoming, although she never minded this. She sometimes pretended she was her own maid, telling them she was not at home. If they walked past her in the garden, she would keep working and they would ignore her because they were certain a great author would never do anything, so regulars just hose down the roses. Occasionally, she would even slip out the back window and run into the woods. However, thanks to the success of Little Women, she was able to publish many more novels, which were also quite popular, and this helped her realize her early dreams of paying her family's bills and becoming financially independent. So hey, good job, Louisa. You wound up accomplishing what you set out to do. May we all be able to do that as authors, huh? Little Women, as many of us know, is still incredibly popular. There have been so many editions over the years. I found quite a few covers. Here they are. <laughs> the meat of it all. Let's get to those references. I'm going to refer to the page numbers in the book that I have back here. Your page numbers may differ, but they should still be pretty close. I'm just going to say the page numbers to help you orientate where these references can be found in the book. Page four, Undine and Centrum. Four tales akin to the Four Seasons. Undine and Sintram itself is the tale of a water sprite who learns to love and gains a soul. But this reference is to the book by Friedrich de la Motte Folk. Still page four, Faber's drawing pencils. Faber is apparently the oldest pencil manufacturer, or at least the oldest drawing pencil manufacturer, founded in 1761 and still available as Faber Castell. Page six, as a China aster. A China aster is a cool leather annual in many colors. Page 14, Pilgrim's Progress. Pilgrim's Progress is a Christian allegory regarded as the progenitor of the narrative aspect of Christian media. The first part follows the journey of protagonist Christian who travels through such places as the Valley of the Shadow of Death, the Delectable Mountains, and finally, the Celestial City. He does all this while burdened with sin and has to bypass temptations in order to enter the Celestial City. The second part follows his wife, Christiana, and their sons on a similar journey, but not all of them go to the Celestial City, opting instead to stay and support a church. The novel was by John Bunyan and published in 1678. Page 25. Green Bays on the Floor. Bays or Bez? is a felted fabric normally covering gaming tables. So when you see a pool table or poker table, that's green bays. Page 32, The Heir of Redcliffe. This is a book published 1853 by Charlotte Young. 
It is the story of said heir, his cousin, and two sisters whom they love. Page 35, a snood, a hairnet meant to be seen in public. Page 43, blunderbuss. This is a short muzzle-loading shoulder weapon, which always makes me think of Elmer Fudd. Page 44, a merry time over the bonbons and mottos. Motto lozenges were early conversation hearts, probably not this exact type shown in the picture, but close enough. Candies with little sayings on them. Also page 44, a quiet game of buzz. Buzz is a counting game of 10 played at a fast pace by older children with good counting skills. The players sit in a circle and count up, substituting buzz for any multiple of 7. And this is the best picture I could find, which kind of looks like they're doing a seance or something. Page 48. Old Man of the Sea. This is too early to be a Hemingway reference. Proteus from the Odyssey. Menelaus captured and held him so he could get information, even though Proteus kept changing shape, which made it very awkward. Page 53. Belsham's Essays. Essays, Philosophical and Moral, Historical and Literary, published in two volumes from 1789 and 1799. William Belsham was a strong advocate of progressive political liberty. Page 57, Vicar of Wakefield. This is a novel by Oliver Goldsmith, published 1766. A wealthy vicar abruptly loses his money. His family encounters various troubles, but all comes right in the end. Page 61, Uncle Tom. This is Uncle Tom's Cabin, the famous novel by Harriet Beecher Stowe, published 1852 in two volumes, an early abolitionist work which helped shape attitudes leading up to the Civil War. Page 63. Ivanhoe, another famous novel to this day by Sir Walter Scott, published 1819 in three volumes. Page 65. Blanc Mange, a dessert popular in Europe, made with milk or cream, sugar, gelatin, cornstarch, Irish moss, no kidding, often flavored with almonds, set in a mold, and served cold. Page 87. Rag money. This is a derisive term for paper money. In the early days, paper itself was mostly made from cotton and linen fibers from rags. Page 96. The Seven Castles of Diamond Lake Play. This may be after the Castles of the Seven Passions, which was published in 1844 through 45 by Edward Sterling. Page 101. Read aloud from Bremer. This is Frederica Bremer, a Swedish writer and reformer regarded as the Swedish Jane Austen. Read aloud from Scott. This is Sir Walter Scott again. Or Edgeworth. This is Maria Edgeworth, who is Irish and also a realistic author, although more on the children's literature side. Page 130, The Pickwick Portfolio. As mentioned, this is after the Pickwick Papers by Charles Dickens. It is his first novel, from 1836, which popularized serializing novels and cliffhanger endings. The story follows the members of the Pickwick Club, who make journeys to places far from London and report on their findings. Page 141, Sari Gamp. I believe that is the correct pronunciation. This is another Dickens character, from Martin Chuzzlewit. A nurse of questionable practices given to rambling speeches. Louisa loved doing impressions of her, particularly for the convalescing soldiers in Washington. Page 141, The Wide, Wide World. This is a novel by Susan Warner, published 1850. It is popularly thought of as America's first bestseller, and is about a young woman whose mother falls ill and is sent to live with relatives. She grows and matures as she confronts various trying episodes of life. Page 143, Try the patience of a Boaz. This may be a biblical reference. Boaz helped Ruth through difficulties. But then again, the addition of the Miss Malaprop reference may refer to Amy's mixing up Boaz with something else. Miss Malaprop is a character from the still popular play The Rivals, who constantly mixes things up. In fact, the word Malapropisms comes from that. Page 144, Saleratus. 
This is an old word for sodium bicarbonate, aka the main ingredient of baking powder. Page 148. Deaconed. This is a term for arranging things, particularly fruit or vegetables, so that the best produce is at the top. Page 162. Dyspeptic. This is an old phrase for indigestion. Page 164. Authors. This is a still decently popular card game, published first in 1861 and is an early version of Go Fish. Louisa herself later became the only female author included in the game. Page 170. The Sea Lion. This is probably in reference to The Sea Lions by James Fenimore Cooper, published 1849, about two sealers stranded on Antarctic ice. And in case you're wondering, yes, a sealer is like a whaler. It's somebody who hunts seals. Page 171, John Bull. If you're British, no doubt you know who John Bull is, but we Americans are probably more clueless. John Bull is kind of like the British Uncle Sam. He's representative of Britain, but he originated earlier in the 18th century and was created by John Arbuthnot for a 1712 satirical pamphlet. Page 172, Schiller's Mary Stuart. This is a play in five acts about the queen when she was a prisoner. You can read this on Project Gutenberg. Page 175, Ellen Tree. Ellen Tree was a real-life British actress who found success in the West End. She came to America in 1836 for a very successful tour of Shakespeare plays. Page 196, a bandbox. A bandbox is a cardboard box, more typically a hat box. Page 198, Atalanta. Atalanta was a Greek human and huntress, but she was mythological. Page 226, Nurse Her Cold with Arsenicum. Arsenicum album is a medicine used in homeopathy to treat digestive issues. Page 276, Boswell's Johnson. The Life of Samuel Johnson by James Boswell, published 1791, was a biography of writer Samuel Johnson. Also page 276, Rasselas, or Rasselas. The History of Rasselas, Prince of Abyssinia, which was also by Samuel Johnson, published 1759. Page 277, Rambler. The Rambler, also by Johnson, was published 1750. These are essays on the disappointments of life. End of part one. Feel free to take a breath. Little intermission. <sighs> okay, we're back for part two. You ready? All right, me too. Page 313, Parian Psyche. This is a particular figurine of the goddess Psyche, usually paired with one of Eros. Page 314, Mr. Tootles. This could be in reference to The Tootles, which was a play by William E. Burton, published 1848. He also starred as Mr. Tootles. Page 321, Mrs. Gummidge. This is a character from David Copperfield, who stays with Mr. Peggotty. Page 325, Lavender and Moiré. This is silk fabric which has been manipulated with heat and rollers to give it a rippled appearance. Page 325, Jupiter Ammon. Ammon is an oracle of North Africa who is considered by the Romans to be an embodiment of Jupiter. Page 327, Three Hebes. Hebe was the Greek goddess of youth and also the cupbearer to the gods. Page 332, Murillo. Murillo was a Spanish Baroque painter from 1617 through 1682, known for religious works and portraits. Page 335, her Maria Teresa heir. Maria Teresa, who lived from 1717 through 1780, was the ruler of the Habsburg dominions, aka Austria, Hungary, Croatia, etc., etc., from 1740 on to the end of her life. Page 336. I'm not sure how to pronounce this. A charabank or a charabank? This is an open wagon, sometimes with a roof, but with no walls, 
with rows of forward-facing seats, which is made for large groups. Page 347, Belzoni. Belzoni was an Italian explorer who lived from 1778 through 1823. He was an early archaeologist of Egyptian antiques. Page 347 as well, and I have never known how to pronounce this. Cheops? 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 A.K.A. Khufu, uh, an ancient Egyptian monarch who died in 2566 B.C. Page 354. Bustled about like a true Martha. Martha is described as a thorough housewife encountered by Jesus on his travels. She was more concerned with what she could do for him than with what he might actually want. You can find the reference in the Bible, Luke 10, 28 through 42. Page 361, a tender Niobe. Niobe was a Greek mythological princess whose 14 children were slain by Apollo and Artemis. Oh my gosh. Page 366, Mr. Mantellini. This is a character in Nicholas Nickleby who is described as a wastrel and spendthrift. Page 74, Mantua Maker. This is an early term for one who cuts outer garments for women. A mantua was originally a loose gown, which later became an overrobe. Page 407, A Colliery. A colliery is a coal mine, buildings and equipment therefore, so the whole shebang. Page 407, The Flirtations of Captain Cavendish. This probably refers to Cavendish, or The Patrician at Sea, which was published in 1854 by W. Johnson Neal. Page 411. Pictures by Turner, Lawrence Reynolds, and Hogarth. Well, J. M. W. Turner, 1775-1851, through 1851, was known as a painter of light. Oh my gosh, that's pretty, no wonder. Sir Thomas Lawrence, from 1769-1830, through 1830, known for portraits. Joshua Reynolds from 1723 through 1792, also known for portraits. And William Hogarth from 1697 through 1764, known for portraits, but also a comic strip style series, which were called Modern Moral Subjects. Page 412, Père Lachaise. Now, Père means father and Chaise means chair. However, this is a very large French cemetery, which houses Oscar Wilde, Jim Morrison, Maria Callas, so on and so forth. Page 415, Schiller's statue. This is probably in reference to the Goethe Schiller statue, which is in Weimar. Page 415, Daniker's famous Ariadne. Daniker was a famous sculptor from 1758 through 1841. Ariadne on the Panther was labeled by the sculptor as representing wildness tamed by beauty. Page 425, Cock Robin. This is a nursery rhyme which was first published in 1744. Who killed Cock Robin? I, said the sparrow, with my little bow and arrow. I killed Cock Robin. Page 426, Up with the Bonnets of Bonnie Dundee. This is a poem slash song by Sir Walter Scott, who also wrote Ivanhoe. He wrote this one in 1825, honoring John Graham, who was the first Viscount Dundee, and who died leading a Jacobite uprising. Page 435, there's also an earlier reference to this because I had trouble finding it, acted like Sancho. Now, Sancho is apparently Spanish for basically a male, so this probably means acted like rough and tumble boys. However, according to the Google, it also can mean a pig, so maybe there's a little bit of both. Page 441. Little kobolds. A kobold has been adapted to Dungeons and Dragons. However, it traditionally means a household sprite of neutral spirit, which will play tricks if it's insulted. It was once a common idea all over pagan Europe, and it survived through German legends after Catholicism swept through. Page 442, a broken meerschaum. Meerschaum pipes are made from the mineral of the same name and are known for their intricate carvings. Page 451, Sartor Resartus. This is an 1831 novel by Thomas Carlyle, which is a parody of Hegelian philosophy. It uses a review of a fake book about clothes as a device. 
Page 459, and I do not know how to pronounce this. Madame de Steels, Steels? Madame de that. Uh, she lived from 1766 through 1817. She was a famous philosopher and a political theorist. Also page 459, another Corinne. Corinne was a novel by Madame de that, published in 1807. Also page 459, Orpheus. Orpheus is famous in Greek mythology as a bard, musician, and prophet who traveled with Jason and the Argonauts. Page 461, Death of Wallenstein. This is a play by Frederick Schiller again about the military commander. It was published in 1799. Page 470, Grace of A. Phillips. This is in reference to Wendell Phillips, who lived from 1811 through 1884. He was a famous orator, and his speeches helped to fire the anti-slavery cause, which led up to the Civil War. Also page 470, Eloquence of Demosthenes. Demosthenes lived from 384 through 322 BC. He was a famous statesman and orator of ancient Athens. Page 471, A Jew's Harp. This is a small mouth instrument with a reed. The vibrations of the reed cause a sound. The etymology is uncertain as it has nothing to do with Jewish people or customs historically and it even has historical occurrences dating as far back as ancient China. Page 478, Sonata Pathétique. This is Sonata No. 8 by Beethoven, written 1798 when he was just 27. Page 481, don't mean to be a marplot. A marplot is one who frustrates a plan through meddling. Page 492, Ristori or Dickens. Well, we covered Dickens. Ristori was Giovanni Alberto Ristori, an opera composer and conductor who lived from 1692 through 1753. Although I also did find a reference to a lady Ristori. I believe she was an actress. Here she is. Page 492 as well. Victor Emmanuel. I believe this is in reference to a Victor Emmanuel II, who was king of Italy from 1820 through 1878. Also page 492. Queen of the Sandwich Islands, Queen Emma, Kala Nikau Maka Amano Kale Leonalani Naya Rook, who was Queen of Hawaii from 1856 through 1863, while her husband Kamehameha IV was king. Also, page 492, a barouche. This is a four wheeled horse drawn carriage with a collapsible top. Page 498, Juno esque. An ancient Roman goddess, Juno was the equivalent of the Greek Hera and the protector of the Roman state. Page 501, A Daughter of the Gods. This is From a Dream of Fair Women by Lord Alfred Tennyson. Page 501, Polka Radawa. This is a version of the polka which is danced in three-quarter time. Page 503, Fontaine para men. This is a term for a woman who wears cosmetics. Shocking. Page 524, Capoline. This was hard to track down, but it appears to be this type of hat, which is actually a wool-brimmed base hat for milliner's use. Page 527, Dolce far niente. This is a popular Italian saying, which basically means the sweetness of doing nothing. I like that. Page 533, Juvin's Best Gloves. Javier Juvin invented a cutting die to make ladies' gloves fit more precisely. Page 537. Played Rary with Puck. John Solomon Rary, who lived from 1827 through 1866, was well known as a horse tamer and whisperer. Page 538. Telemachus. Telemachus was the son of Odysseus and Penelope, who went in search of his father, only to find his father had reached home before him. Page 552, Mrs. Grundy. This is not a Riverdale reference. The original Mrs. Grundy was a character from the play Speed the Plow in 1798 by Thomas Morton. It is a character whose name has come to exemplify censorship through conventional opinions, such as what will the neighbors think. Page 562, Bonavard. François Bonavard who inspired the Byron poem, The Prisoner of Chillon. He lived from 1493 through 1570. 
Page 582. As Peggotty said of David, this is Clara Peggotty, the housekeeper in David Copperfield, who plays a big part in his upbringing. Page 586. Chatelain. This can mean a belt on which you hook various objects, but I believe the reference here is the mistress of a household. Page 587. Ad libitum. Or libitum? I don't know Latin. But it does mean as much or often as necessary or desired. Page 593. Mignon's song. Mignon is a character in Goethe's Wilhelm Meister novels. She sings Kennst du das Land, which has been set to music by various composers. Ah, German, that musical language. Page 597. Madame Recamier. She lived from 1777 through 1849, a famous and popular French socialite in her day. Page 601. A little Dorcas. Dorcas was an early disciple of Jesus, known for acts of mercy toward the poor. Page 601. St. Martin. Not just an island. He is the saint of mixed race people, barbers, innkeepers, etc., also known for kind acts toward the poor. Page 605. Alcibiades. Alcibiades was an Athenian statesman and a close friend, possible lover, of Socrates. Page 617. A demijohn. A demijohn is a narrow neck bottle, usually enclosed in a wicker cover. Page 625. Fair Dead Catherine. This is probably in reference to Catherine of Alexandria, who was a martyr and saint. In fact, Joan of Arc claims that she was one of the visions who appeared to her. Page 637. Tusser, Cowley, and Columella. Thomas Tusser, who lived from 1524 through 1580, was an English poet known for, among other things, 500 points of good husbandry. Abraham Cowley, 1618 through 1667, was an English poet and essayist, known for the Pindaric Odes, the Mistress, etc., etc. And Lucius Junius Moderatus Columella, from 480 through 70 AD, was a Roman writer on agriculture, known for De Rerustica. De Rerustica. De one of those. Ha 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 ha! We've made it to the end! Hooray! Woohoo! And now you know a lot more about Little Women than you ever thought you would or expected to or possibly wanted to. But hey, me too. We have all learned something today. I can't wait to do this again, in fact. Which book should I do it with? Any ideas? Yeah, definitely. If you have ideas, any uh, old books with references you, you want to know more about, just put them down in the comments and I will... I will do that work. I will do that research. And I guess we'll find out what book I end up doing. <laughs> but it'll take a little bit of work, so that won't be the next video. I'm not actually sure what video I'm doing next, so it's all a big mystery. How exciting. In any case, I'll see you next week. I hope. Have a good one. Bye.